Uh, we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, and I need to tell members that question four has been withdrawn. We will start with listed questions, and I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Question number one. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The aim of Tourism Ireland's sponsorship is to leverage the popularity of the Ireland cricket team, whose profile has grown in world cricket in recent years, to support tourism growth from Australia and New Zealand, as well as other key cricket-loving countries, including England, India, and South Africa. Sport-related tourism has emerged as a very significant element in world tourism in recent years. High-profile sporting events such as the ICC Cricket World Cup provide Tourism Ireland with a unique opportunity to highlight the island of Ireland as a holiday destination as well as top location for sporting events. The ICC Cricket World Cup, which is currently taking place in Australia and New Zealand, is one of the world's biggest sporting events of 2015 in terms of its global viewing audience being televised in 220 countries to a potential 2.5 billion viewers. And may I say they are being treated Mr. Deputy Speaker, to some thrilling exploits by the Ireland team, who, after winning their opening two games, including a victory over the West Indies, came up short in their match against South Africa earlier on today. For supplementary. Uh, Agat, uh, and, uh, Shane, and I want to thank the Minister for her answer. And I know the cricket team isn't doing that so well, so well today. They're up against South Africa. Minister, you'll be aware that half the, the world turns green at this time of year for St. Patrick's Day. Some landmark uh, buildings in the world, like the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the pyramids in uh, Egypt, in response to my colleague, uh, some of my colleagues at last week's uh, enterprise Order, meeting. Please. Where is this question going? Know, the, 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 the CEO of Tourism Ireland, um, who is responsible for the Green Initiative, said turning this building green for the occasion would help the Global Greening Initiative. Would the Minister agree uh, to support this initiative? Well, it's a good jump from the Ireland Cricket World Cup uh, chances to the uh, Minister, greening Minister, I was of waiting on the result. <laughs> Indeed, and uh, we're still hopeful that we can get to the quarterfinals, and uh, we know that we're very much behind, uh, particularly those members of the team from Northern Ireland, including the captain, and we send them all our best wishes. Um, in respect of the greening of this building, of course, Tourism Ireland is concerned with promoting uh, Northern Ireland and the rest of the island outside of the island of Ireland, and so they have uh, approached uh, many iconic buildings across the world, and they light them up green, and it has become uh, very much an attraction in relation to St. Patrick's Day. As regards this building, uh, which is in Northern Ireland, um, uh, it's a matter entirely for the Commission as to whether they decide uh, to go down this route, because I know they've had discussions, and there was some commentary last week, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in and around whether if you light it up green on St. Patrick's Day, then there are other days it would need to be marked as well. Well, Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today. I think we all recognise the enormous role sport has in promoting the positive image of Northern Ireland, whether it, it is through our cricket players or leading golfers like Hollywood's Rory McIlroy and indeed, and indeed our latest boxing star, Carl North Frampton. North what is Tourism Ireland doing to market one of her other sporting gems, her famous our world-famous Circuit of Ireland Rally, which is now part of the European Rally Championship. I thank the uh, member for his question, which is sport-related, to answer the member who is sedentary across the way, and which I can hear mention that. Um, uh, the, European, the European Rally Championship... Our order, please. I know a little bit of banter is, is to be encouraged at times, but it really can get to excess. Minister. The, uh, I had the great pleasure of being along with some colleagues at the Circuit of Ireland uh, rally launch, uh, which was hosted uh, by Lisburn City Council just last week. And uh, again, we're hoping for a very good Circuit of Ireland, uh, particularly because of the fact that it is part of the European Rally Championship, and that allows us then uh, to publish um, some media uh, outside of Northern Ireland and to show off our beautiful scenery right across uh, the world, because we know that there are many, many uh, enthusiasts, 
for Raleigh and not least the member uh, that asked the question. Um, in relation to what Tourism Ireland are doing to promote uh, this year's event, uh, through its commercial relationship uh, with Eurosport, uh, Tourism Ireland has in recent years secured an invitation uh, for the Circuit of Ireland uh, rally to stage and provide footage of the UK and Ireland leg of the European Rally Championship. And as I say, that, that will allow us to get that global television exposure. And I think that's very, very important. Well, Mr. Alvin McGuinness, who no doubt will choose his sport. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, could I thank the Minister for her um, encouraging remarks in relation to the Irish cricket team? Um, but given the remarkable success and given the obvious uh, uh, focus there is of the, on the island of Ireland, what uh, plans has she to encourage Tourism Ireland to exploit that market opportunity in the near future? <laughs> Well, in relation to sport, I think we're already exploiting it, but there's always more that we can do, uh, particularly in and around golf and the fact that we do have the Irish Open coming to Northern Ireland to Royal County Down uh, in May of this year. And I know that Tourism Ireland, along with Tourism NI, uh, is working very hard as to how they can promote Northern Ireland, in particular in relation uh, to that fabulous event that's coming. Uh, he will know, of course, as well, that we are working on a joint bid in terms of the Rugby World Cup. Uh, and again, we're pushing ahead with that. Uh, we're garnering support for that bid. Uh, we believe it would be uh, a marvellous uh, thing to achieve to bring the Rugby World Cup uh, to the island and uh, to have events up here in Northern Ireland. And can I say and send my congratulations, and I'm sure I speak for the whole House, uh, to the Ireland Rugby World uh, team at the weekend when we had a marvellous uh, victory over England. And we look forward to the Grand Slam. Mr. Tom Elliott for a question. Question number two, Deputy Speaker. Northern Ireland Electricity has no plans to change its dedicated customer helpline number. The rest of the UK is made up of multiple network operators, whereas in Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland Electricity is the sole network owner through which all power cuts are reported. Northern Ireland Electricity continues to promote its contact number through a range of channels. Mr. Elliott for supplementary. I uh, thank the, the Minister for that update. And I'm just wondering, uh, would the Minister agree that, uh, given the equal citizenship of Northern Ireland within the, the United Kingdom, that they should be included in that single simple number uh, throughout the, the UK right from the start and the inception of the project, as opposed to what it said in the consultation document, that it may join subsequently? Well, I, I understand... Uh, absolutely where the member is coming from uh, in respect uh, of this question. But I would say to him this, that if you go into a, a national number like that, you go into a call centre and there's always the risk um, that people don't know where, where you're talking about when you ring up and say, uh, I have a power cut in Derry Loman. Um, are they going to say, and where's that? Uh, and it causes all sorts of difficulties in that regard. And NIE, given that they are the sole operator in terms of the grid, uh, and the network in Northern Ireland believe that their customer helpline uh, is the one that uh, should be familiar to people. Uh, certainly, if the member is asking, can we make it uh, more amenable and that everybody knows exactly the number to call, yes, I think there's always more that could be done uh, in respect of that. Uh, but apparently, they have provided me with some satisfaction uh, ratings, and um, they are saying that uh, there's a 99% satisfaction with how quickly the calls are answered, a 97% satisfaction with the accuracy of information provided and a 99% competency of call handler. And I do worry if we're going into a central call system within uh, the whole of the UK that we might lose a little bit of that. Mrs Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, you will be aware that I've been working with Plastec and its managing director, Thomas Hawthorne, and Avoda Renewable Energies, and its owner, Alistair Dixon, who are investing significantly within Lagan Valley. However, they are being obstructed by NIE through a failure, a failure to deliver grid connection, which they've already paid tens of thousands of pounds for over 18 months ago, and a regulator who appears to be powerless to intervene, and indeed said only last week that they, that they could do nothing about yeah, this. Question, so, please. Minister, what are you going to do about this? Well, can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is an issue that is be, becoming uh, more and more uh, of an issue, and I myself, at a constituency level, have had delegations in 
uh, farmers from Fermanagh and West Tyrone that can't get onto the grid. Uh, the member who asked the question has been writing to me on numerous occasions in relation to businesses in her constituency. Uh, to be quite blunt, I'm fed up with this merry-go-round that is going on in relation to grid connection. Um, when we have NIE saying that it's not their issue, it's a Sony issue, Sony will say it's a regulator issue, the regulator uh, will try and pass it to somebody else, and frankly, it cannot go on. So I have called a meeting of all of the parties involved uh, to discuss these issues and to try to get to the bottom of these grid connection issues. And uh, if we cannot uh, deal with the matters around the table in a voluntary way, then I will have to look at other measures as to how we deal with this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Speaker, thanks, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, what recent discussions have you had um, with steps within your department to improve the security of electricity supply on the island? Well, uh, of course, I'll be just concerned with uh, security of supply uh, in my own jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and as uh, the member will know. Um, I have recently, uh, in consultation uh, with the systems operator and the regulator, we put out a contract in terms of uh, more uh, uh, generation because we felt that there may uh, in the future be a gap. Uh, some people have criticised us for that, but certainly I felt that there was a need to make sure that we did have security of supply uh, in terms of the population of Northern Ireland. It is hugely important, and that is why we took that decision. Yeah. Mr. Roy Beggs. Question number three. Uh, my department has just awarded a contract to BT for a new project, the UK Superfast Rollout Programme, which will further extend access to superfast broadband across Northern Ireland by 2017. And while the majority of enterprise and business parks in Northern Ireland, of which my department is aware, already have access to superfast broadband services, there remain some in areas that do not. I have indicated my desire that business parks are prioritised under this new service. Under the Super Connected Cities programme, uh, being led by the UK Government, business premises, including those in business parks in Belfast and Londonderry, are eligible to apply for vouchers up to £3,000 to cover the cost of high-speed broadband installation. This programme is now being extended to include other areas and presents an opportunity for our new super councils to apply for a voucher scheme similar to those that exist in Belfast and Londonderry Council areas. Call Mr Beggs for supplementary. I'm, a, I'm aware that in other parts of the UK uh, where there has been under provision of super fast broadband that uh, open reach has facilitated local communities where they themselves have not uh, introduced uh, Superfast broadband to, to local communities, and they say because of economic reasons. Can I ask the minister, has she been in discussions with BT Openreach uh, so that that sort of flexible facility will be available to local communities and businesses here, wh which may not be included in the scheme that she is currently mentioned? Well, there are two schemes that I've just mentioned. The first is the UK Superfast Rollout uh, Programme, and the second uh, is uh, the Super Connected Cities Programme. And I think the Super Connected Cities Programme is one uh, that particularly Super Councils should look at. It was initially rolled out in Belfast, then it was extended uh, to our second city, and now it's going to be available right across Northern Ireland. And I think there are, uh, given that the new Super Councils will have new powers in April, they should very much be looking at doing something together in terms of these voucher schemes and I think it's a great opportunity to try and infill what hasn't been filled uh, to date. Mr Paul Given. Thank you Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister if she can provide some more details about the £17 million investment that her department announced uh, last week? Well, that's in relation to the first of the schemes, uh, the, super the UK Superfast uh, Rollout Programme, which is uh, a UK scheme. Um, so uh, it's funded by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, uh, ourselves, uh, and indeed BT. And it's envisaged that the project will begin uh, with a survey and design process, which will take place over a number of months, uh, and then we'll begin, or rather not me, BT, will begin re-engineering uh, the network changing uh, into a, a fibre-rich uh, open access network, enabling more people 
uh, to enjoy a super fast broadband. And that continues whilst at the same time the Northern Ireland Broadband uh, Improvement Fund is also taking place because I know members may uh, question me as to never mind about super fast, what about having uh, a good broadband service? So the, the other broadband uh, intervention that is still ongoing uh, does not finish until near the end of this year. Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, thanks very much. And the minister almost stole my thunder there, saying, "Whatever about super uh, fast, can we? What about the rest?" Um, there, there are some towns where the capacity for businesses to grow is being inhibited by the underimprovement of the broadband. So, I'm wondering if the minister or her department has carried out any sort of an audit of those towns to see where they've been inhibited. I have one in mind in Mahara, where an actual it is actually a software development company and, and a computer company cannot expand because of the, the lack of capacity on the broadband. So I am wondering has there been any audit carried out to see where there are, if you like, uh, broadband hotspots or, or not spots or diminished spots uh, that uh, interventions could be required to help and facilitate economic development? Well, there's a couple of things there. I, I, I don't know whether the member has uh, furnished me with the postcode to see whether it's um, going to be covered under the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Pro uh, Programme, which is still ongoing. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is in relation to the super-connected cities money. As I say, new super councils will be able uh, to apply for that money, and I'm hoping uh, that that will make a difference locally uh, as well. Uh, in relation to an audit, um, I asked actually Invest and I not to audit towns but to audit business parks uh, to try and establish what their connectivity was. And of the 80 business parks currently supported. Uh, by Invest Northern Ireland or Enterprise Northern Ireland. 66 of those can get super fast speeds and 14 uh, do not. Uh, but of those, 10 are on the intervention area uh, for the super fast rollout programme, uh, and the other two, what, two are in Belfast City Council area, so they can apply under the super connected fund, uh, and then two are between uh, the 15 and 23 megabytes. So, there is a number of funds out there at the moment. Uh, I think it is a wee bit confusing, if I am honest myself. Uh, and what I may do is, is uh, put in place uh, a sheet, of an A4 side, which just details all of the different interventions that are ongoing at the moment, and hopefully that will be of assistance to MLAs. Mr. Sammy Wilson for a question. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have received representations from and discussed a range of energy issues, including pricing, with a number of local businesses and their representative bodies. I continue to support businesses through the promotion of competition, innovation and investment. The recently announced reductions in electricity tariffs is good news for our small business consumers and means that from April prices will now be lower than the EU15 median, approximately 5% lower than the Great, British, uh, Great Britain average and around 19% lower than those in the Republic of Ireland. Large energy users negotiate requirements directly with suppliers and I understand that some of our larger users may already be benefiting from falling electricity bills. Of course, motorists and those using oil for home heating will have benefited from falling prices as well. And tomorrow, I will hope to be attending an information event on gas to the West, which will provide up to 40,000 energy consumers, mm -hmm. including businesses, with a more efficient, lower carbon and potentially cheaper choice of fuel. Yeah. Wilson, for Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And whilst we must all welcome the impact of the downward turn in the market on energy prices internationally. Does she recognise that, first of all, many firms in Northern Ireland, especially large consumers of energy, do admit that one of the problems is the cost of energy when it comes to expansion and comes to investment? And since our grid is getting increasingly overloaded with expensive electricity from renewable sources, what uh, requests has she made to the government at Westminster, it seems now to be receptive to this, uh, to reduce the uh, percentage of electricity which has to be produced through expensive renewable sources? Well, I, I have ongoing discussions uh, with my counterpart uh, in Westminster, and indeed I had a meeting with him very recently, Ed Davey, the Energy Secretary. Uh, in relation to electricity market reform, uh, which is ongoing, and uh, uh, there are some very difficult uh, decisions that will have to be taken in relation to electricity market reform. 
Uh, I've also spoken with the regulator um, on a number of occasions, lastly just again today in relation to large energy users and uh, their pricing. And I'm hoping uh, that there will be some developments on that from the regulator uh, before the end of the month. Mr. Fergal McKee. Deputy Speaker, earlier the Minister alluded to action uh, or measures in relation to connectivity. I wonder could she expand on that but, and also on what further measures the Minister will put in place in terms of action to lessen the impact on businesses? Well, I, of course, uh, it's a matter for the regulator as to um, what um, happens in relation to pricing. I can uh, talk to the regulator, I can try and, and point her in the right direction, but at the end of the day it is a matter for the regulator. But as I say, we're having this round table meeting in terms of, of grid connection. And I have no doubt that one of the issues that will come up uh, at that meeting will be the interconnectivity that we need uh, with the rest of the island. Uh, indeed, uh, the connectivity with Great Britain as well. Uh, and um, unfortunately, both of those uh, are not uh, operating to full capacity at the moment. The member knows that we need a second interconnector in terms of the north-south interconnector, and we need to ensure as well that the Moyle interconnector is up to full capacity again as well, and we're hoping that that will be the case by next year. Mr Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, does the Minister not find it a, a, a little rich that the repeated complaints um, that renewable energy, in particular wind energy, are driving up prices are somewhat hypocritical given that it was the person asking the question who actually changed the planning policy and liberalised it so that we could expand <laughs> and bring in wind farm schemes? Just had to have a bit of fun. I'm waiting on an intervention, um, Mr Deputy Chief, Speaker. Chief but uh, I, if there is a spat going on between the member and the member for East Antrim, I'll allow that to take place elsewhere. Uh, what I will say uh, is that uh, we are looking at the strategic energy framework uh, at present. We're uh, looking at it in terms of cost-benefit analysis and in the context of electricity market reform, uh, which is coming at us uh, very quickly uh, and which will cause a huge uh, change in the way in which electricity comes to us uh, over the next period of time. So this House should be very much aware that electricity market reform will, prov uh, will provide a huge challenge for us in Northern Ireland, not least because we are in a single electricity market on this island and uh, we will have to bid in uh, in terms of contracts for difference uh, moving forward and the <coughs> renewable obligation certificates will be no more. So there's a lot of change coming, Mr Deputy Speaker, and this House will need to be very much a part of that. Mr Phil Flanning. I thank the Minister for her answers. Um, the, the Minister might accept that the um, high price of, ener of energy and electricity for um, large energy users and manufacturing companies is um, a barrier to attracting and also retaining jobs in the manufacturing sector here. Can I ask her to outline what action she has taken uh, to support large energy users who face uncompetitively um, high energy costs compared with their counterparts around Europe? Well, uh as he knows, we've been in consultation with the utility regulator in relation to this very important issue. Of course, 60% of the cost in terms of large energy users is the wholesale price. Uh, and as I've said, that is uh, moving in a downward uh, direction at the moment. And I'm hoping that uh, that will uh, come through to those large energy users uh, as their contracts start to change uh, in the future. Uh, but it is important as well that we deal uh, with constraints uh, on uh, the single electricity market, and that includes the north-south interconnector. Uh, it is important that we have that in place because at the moment that is costing uh, around 20 million euros uh, to the consumers on the island of Ireland and I'm sure he would agree that it's unacceptable that we proceed with it in that manner. Mr Jim Allister for a question. Unlike here in Northern Ireland, the Welsh have not had the same long public debate around the merits of devolving corporation tax, nor have they developed a plan to use such powers for a very clear economic development purpose. It is therefore unsurprising that the Silk Commission concluded that income tax was more appropriate to devolve to the Welsh Government uh, than other major UK taxes, including corporation tax. 
The case for reducing corporation tax in Northern Ireland is very different to that in Wales. The Silk Commission acknowledged this in its report, describing corporation tax as a useful policy tool for us because of the fiscal competition we face from sharing a land border with the Republic of Ireland. The latest research commissioned by my department, which takes into account both the costs and benefits of reduced corporation tax, continue to demonstrate a strong economic case for Northern Ireland. Alistair, is it not quite striking, though, that another region of the United Kingdom, which is also block grant dependent, most thoroughly investigated the issue of corporation tax uh, through a proper commission uh, and reached this conclusion, whereas we seem to have rushed uh, to the end game without any comparable consideration? And on the issue of just how attractive reducing corporation tax is, and all the hype of that in the context of manufacturing industry. Is the Minister not struck by the fact that at the very time when it seems corporation tax will be reduced, one of our largest manufacturers, alas, JTI, are going to part, depart our shores, undeterred by the lure that Mr. Alistair, exists I think we've got a corporation. question at this stage. Well, in relation to the, the latter uh, point of the question, um, we did discuss the lowering of corporation tax uh, with JTI Gallagher. He would expect me to do that. Uh, because of the um, tax system in Japan, they would not have benefited uh, from it here in Northern Ireland. And uh, we did, of course, look at that in great detail. Uh, but in relation to uh, rushing into the, our support for the lowering of corporation tax, I mean, my goodness, uh, this been? has been around since devolution came back in 2007. Uh, I don't call that rushing into a decision. Uh, the entire business community, from the Federation of Small Businesses right up to the CBI, are, are in support of this uh, policy development. Uh, and I would say to the member that he may not wish to move forward and have ambition for Northern Ireland moving into the future, but I do. And I want Northern Ireland to become a powerhouse. I want it to become what I know it can become, and it has great potential to become. And I'm sure uh, there are other members in this House that have ambition for Northern Ireland as well, and that's where I sit. Mr. Martin O'Malley. As, as the Welsh would say, and as we're talking about our Welsh cousins, I wonder would the Minister, uh, in, in the context of, of Mr Cameron on Friday announcing the next step to devolving income tax power, does she think that income tax is the next tax raising power which we will seek and that that also will bring benefits to our economy here? Well, I think we need to deal with the, the power that uh, hopefully we will have uh, by the end of uh, this uh, parliamentary term, and we know uh, that the um, bill is going through the various uh, parts in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and as I understand, it should be finished its legislative journey uh, towards the middle of March, and then we will be able to move forward and to make the most of that power when we agree a rate uh, and a date for implementation and we can take forward all of the evidence that is there because one of the points uh, that Mr Alistair also raised was the fact that we hadn't looked at comparable uh, areas in relation to corporation tax and we have of course had that work completed for us and I'm sure uh, if he looks at some of the work carried out by the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy now the University of Ulster Business School he will see that work there. Uh, we will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Carmagad, I appreciate last concern. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for an update on the Rural Broadband Improvement Programme that has been rolled out at the minute, please? Uh, well, I know that the member has particular interest uh, in this uh, programme, and he has always been very faithful in asking me uh, about the programme. Uh, indeed, the programme is going very well, and for those areas that have already had the intervention uh, from the programme, they report very good successes. Uh, and uh, if the member has a particular area that he wants me to look at, uh, I certainly will feed those postcodes in. Uh, to see whether they are on the programme, first of all, and then what the timescale is for implementation. Mr Boylan, for supplementary. Hey, hey, could I thank the Minister for a response, and, and it is a welcome programme, but I could have just asked the Minister in relation to the original target, was, I think, was 48,000 homes. Could the Minister indicate where she's at in relation to percentage of those homes 
or does she feel that, that we'll actually reach those targets? And maybe she can intimate how new in our mass fair out in that programme as well. Gormil Maggot. Well, unfortunately, I don't have that detail uh, in front of me. Uh, it's 45,000 um, uh, homes that we hope to intervene on. I think we're in and around, from memory, uh, the 30,000 uh, mark uh, in terms of intervention. Um, but I'm certainly happy to follow this up with the member in writing if he so wishes me to do so. Bronwyn McGavin for a topical question. Uh, Gourmet Yogurt, uh, can I ask the Minister, is she aware on her department of the huge uh, tourism potential of Hillof O'Neill and Ron Forley Centre in Dungannon? And, and, and would the Minister agree to undertake to work closely with the new Mid Ulster Council and the Dungannon Regeneration Partnership, which I am a member of, uh, to take forward a strategy to uh, exploit this potential? Gourmet Yogurt. Uh, well, uh, the short answer is I am absolutely, given that we share uh, a constituency, uh, and uh, I am aware of the tourism potential of the Hill of O'Neill and the Ranfurly Centre. And uh, I have visited on a number of occasions, and I'm always impressed by the facility and the way in which it has been integrated into the town of Dungannon uh, in a in a very nice way, I have to say, but also can draw people into the town centre because we, we know that often uh, when um, large scale installations are put in, sometimes they draw people out of town centres. But this is right in the town centre of Dungannon, and the, the council, Dungannon and South Tyrone Borough Council, are to be commended for their work. and I look forward to working with Mid Ulster Council in the future. Mr. Gavin, for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for her response. Does the Minister agree with me that the growth of the tourism sector in, in South Throne offers the potential of jobs and benefits to the local economy, shops and services? Absolutely, and especially when the facility is in the town centre. Of course, it will bring people into the town centre in terms of uh, the retail experience in Dungannon, uh, as well as visiting coffee shops and what have you. So uh, the tourism um, uh, jobs... Uh, go right across Northern Ireland, and I think that's something that we should always be aware of, uh, that the sector provides jobs right across Northern Ireland, and uh, of course I would hope that that will be the case in Dungannon as well. Mr Leslie Cree for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I wonder if the Minister has had any discussions uh, in connection with the €315 billion Euro investment fund that the EU, uh, in fact, is talking about. Um, I think that's the Junker Fund. Am I, am I right about that? Uh, as I understand it, uh, my departmental officials are watching very closely what's going on with that. They haven't had total clarity on how that's going to be rolled out at, mo at the moment, but there are a number of departments, of course, in Northern Ireland that will be interested, not least his own Minister of the Department and the Department of Regional Development. Cree for supplementary. So, I thank the, the Minister for her response. I'm just wondering, Minister, if you have any detail on likely time frames and application and even areas to be, to be covered? Certainly from my perspective, um, we will be looking at it in terms of energy infrastructure to see if there is anything we can augment. Um, we've talked a lot about the grid today, to see if there's anything more we can do in relation to energy storage, energy grid, those sorts of areas. But I'm sure other colleagues will have other uh, priorities as well. Mr Gregory Campbell for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the Northern Ireland Air Show has developed in recent years based at Port Rush. How central does she believe it to be to the economy, not just of the North Coast, but to Northern Ireland as it seeks to develop in the forthcoming years? I thank the member for his question. This is a, a very good example of how uh, a locally organised event has continued to grow year on year and has uh, brought in international uh, uh, attention and acts to uh, the North Coast. And I know for sure that it will continue to be uh, uh, an event which we will want to support uh, in a tangible way through funding, but also uh, in other ways as well. Mr. Campbell for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the air show last year moved from one side of Port Russia to the other in an attempt to uh, develop and expand and did so successfully. Uh, how confident is she that it will receive the necessary support to continue to develop both this year and in the forthcoming years? Well, I am confident that it will because it works very closely um, with Tourism uh, Northern Ireland. 
and indeed with Tourism Ireland in terms of marketing outside of the island of Ireland. So uh, if the member has any specific issues that he wants to raise uh, with me, uh, I'm very happy to meet him to talk to him about those issues. But I, I know that the air show, uh, I just can't remember, is it air waves? It's air waves, uh, it's now called, will go from strength to strength. And it's, it's, it's very much in a lot of people's diaries from year to year. Mr Robin Newton for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the recent jobs announcement at Bombardier, um, redu reduction in jobs, and indeed uh, also the very successful flight of the C Series uh, aircraft project. Would the Minister care to comment on the significance of this C Series project to the future prosperity of Bombardier? Of course. Uh we were disappointed uh, to hear about further job losses in terms of the what's called temporary workers uh, at Bombardier. Um, I'm looking forward to a meeting uh, with senior management here in East Belfast. And I know uh, the member has asked me uh, uh, previously if that was going to happen. I can confirm that that meeting is going to take place now, uh, where we will have discussions about the future of Bombardier and the future. Uh, not wanting to prejudge the meeting, but looking at the, the flight uh, of the C-Series jet looks very good. And we're delighted to see uh, another major milestone uh, in Bombardier's C-Series uh, aircraft programme because it is critical uh, to the East Belfast plant, uh, particularly in relation to the wings which are constructed there. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with Bombardier in the future. Mr Newton for supplementary. Thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister confirm that everything that can be done is being done on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis to support Bombardier um, as they currently develop the project? Well, absolutely. I can confirm um, that that is the case. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland uh, work very closely with Bombardier uh, senior executives uh, that, so that if there's any issue that arises, we are aware of it very, very quickly and can try and help in any way that we can. Um, we believe that uh, Bombardier is a very uh, significant and structurally important part of not just East Belfast but the Northern Ireland economy, uh, and therefore we will continue to give it the attention it deserves. Mr Barry McIlduff for a topical question. Uh, some months ago, Invest NA placed a public advertisement seeking expression of interest from landowners in the Ome area regarding the availability of suitable land for industrial development. Does the Minister have any update on uptake or expressions of interest? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in mid-September, it was uh, Invest NA placed an advertisement seeking interest uh, from, from landowners. A total of 13 areas of land uh, were offered. Uh, following engagement with the DOE planning, nine of these areas were ruled out uh, due to distance outside the OMA settlement limit. A further two have been discounted as they were not received until after the deadline for submissions. And Invest and I is currently conducting a desktop exercise on the remaining two sites to determine their potential suitability for industrial development. I thank the Minister for the specific answer and the detail contained therein. Um, I hope the Minister sees a connection with my supplementary, because I do, although my mind might work in funny ways. Um, enterprise zone status, that might appear like a long shot, but Coleraine has enterprise zone status. Might there be a case for enterprise zone status for Oma, the county town of Tyrone, if you ever hear tell of it? Uh, well, I did hear tell of it, and in fact, I was in the uh, county town of uh, Tyrone last night at a celebration uh, with SMEs and the local council uh, in relation to their uh, local economic development programmes, uh, where 300 businesses had taken up uh, council initiatives, and I was really very pleased to see some of the work that was going on there. So I'm very aware of the county town of uh, Tyrone. Uh, in relation to uh, enterprise zones, uh, I would, Mr Deputy Speaker, very much like to have a conversation with MLAs in relation to enterprise zones because I think there's been a bit of a misunderstanding about what uh, the very specific enterprise zone is in Coleraine. It's a pilot scheme. It has been put in place uh, by Her Majesty's Treasury. It is not in my gift and it is something uh, that uh, we still have to see brought into full action. Mr Declan McAleer for a topical question. Uh, 
Could the Minister outline her proposals to address the simultaneous decline in output, new orders and employment within the private sector, as reported recently in the PMI? Well, the PMI is a snapshot uh, at a particular time. Uh, it is a, and I think it was Richard Ramsey, who is the author of the PMI, who said it was a blip. Uh, at the time, because before that the trend was going uh, upwards, and uh, I'm very happy to take Richard Ramsey's advice in relation to that matter. Mr. for supplementary. Uh, uh, the survey also highlighted the negative implications of the exchange rate in relation to local business. And taking this into account, can the minister commit to addressing the challenges faced by businesses, particularly in border areas? Well, it's one of the reasons why, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've been encouraging uh, companies to look outside of the Eurozone in terms of their export markets. Uh, we accept that they will still very much want to do business with their closest neighbour, but it is important that they look to new markets as well, because we do realise that there are difficulties in relation to the exchange rate at present. Lord Morrow for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that the development of businesses within rural areas, uh, uh, broadband development, is vital. What is the Department's plans for the future development of broadband, in particular in rural areas, not least from Manus South Tyrone? I'm very happy to answer that in relation to Fermanagh and South Throne because, of course, we have the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project, which has been rolled out at the moment. Uh, we also then have the Superfast Connected Cities, uh, which has been rolled out at the moment as well, uh, and then the Superfast Broadband Intervention in conjunction with DCMS. So there are three intervention programmes going on uh, at the moment, uh, and I think we will have more detail put on an A4 sheet so that we can share that with colleagues and they're clear of what's going on. For well, I thank the Minister for her answer, and uh, I'm delighted to hear that, that, in fact, there are immediate plans to develop this. What about a 10 to 15 year strategy for the further development of broadband in these rural communities? Well, I would be very hopeful that in 10 to 15 years that the broadband infrastructure will be very mature by that stage. Um, I have often said in this House that we should not just be looking at fixed line broadband, that we need to look at mobile applications as well, because um, the mobile infrastructure needs to be in place, because there are more and more people using handheld devices now as opposed to the fixed line. Um, that, they, that is traditional in the past. And indeed, I note that uh, Vodafone have very recently uh, set up uh, three pilots uh, in Donamana, uh, in Kalita, and in Pomroy uh, in relation to their uh, rural, bro uh, rural uh, connectivity. And uh, I am meeting with Vodafone in the very near future, and I look forward to hearing how that has been developed uh, in those three areas. Mr. Pat Ramsey for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, could she update the House on the progression of the economic inactivity plans that we have for, for areas of great need? Well, uh, can I say that uh, both myself and the Minister for Employment and Learning have signed off on those plans now and they're going to the executive, I hope, this week. If not this week, then at the next executive. Mr. Ramsey for supplement. Yeah, in light of our previous discussion, Minister, would you be of a mind to ensure that these are programme-led rather than application-driven programmes? Well, I certainly don't want uh, this uh, economic inactivity strategy to be characterised by uh, process. I want it characterised by action, because there's no point in having an inactivity strategy if it's going to be characterised by inactivity. <laughs> so let's, let's get the actions happening on the ground and let's try and make a difference to those people. Yeah. Order. Uh, time is up, and we now return to the debate on point of order. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, does the Deputy Speaker realise that Denny question time was reduced by three minutes? I'm told that we started a couple of minutes early and the, and, and the last person was not in her place, so no one has been cheated.